we go through our discussion today, I just want you to keep in mind that there's two very different concepts when we take a sort of a giant step back and look at privacy, right? Privacy, information privacy, as, as the term has um, arisen over the past, I would say it's still relatively new, maybe 15 uh, years or so, that the term information privacy has been around. Privacy itself is a concept that's been around for centuries, right? Personal space, private property. But information privacy is that right to control the collection, use, and disclosure of your personal information. And that's really key in, in today's time, right? It's about that flow of information. But privacy is all of the things around safeguarding that information when we think about its data flow. Um, when do we need consent? Providing access to information, which is a requirement under our freedom of information laws. Confidentiality is the assurance that information is going to not be shared. So you go to the doctor's office, you, it's a confidential relationship between you and your physician. Um, but if there's files left at the front uh, that are unattended, uh, the receptionist is really loud on the phone about someone's health condition, then that office has not protected privacy, even though there's a confidential relationship. So it's a, an important part of privacy, but it's not the be all end all. And, and certainly our responsibility extends beyond ensuring that the information stays confidential, we need to ensure that it stays safeguarded. We need to know where it's shared and who it's shared with. We need to know how long it's retained. That's another one under privacy, right? Uh, has nothing to do with confidentiality, but if that information is kept longer than is needed, that's a violation of a privacy principle. So let's keep in mind that we want to really look at privacy very uh, broadly. MFIPA, the mandated purposes under the Education Act are we can use, collect, use, disclose information for purposes of educating a child or school administration, or what are often called consistent purposes, right? Anything other than that, we need express consent. Uh, privacy and data security are taken care of under Regulation 823 of MFIPA, where we talk about reasonable measures have to be in place to prevent unauthorized access. And I wanted to focus on the ones that are really technology related. Uh, it's our responsibility to ensure that only those who need the record for the performance of their duties have access to it. And then there must be reasonable measures in place to protect that data from inadvertent destruction. So those are the, the legal requirements. So let's take that and really think of that from the technology perspective. And I'm certainly, in terms of you know, everyone sort of sits somewhere on a spectrum when it comes to privacy. Um, and I, my approach, because I deal so much with um, technology and I do a lot of privacy impact assessments for technology and threat risk assessments, is to really take a pragmatic approach. We certainly don't want to be behind the curve. We certainly have to understand our risks and know how to manage them. But the technology um, that's at our fingertips is very useful and should be used responsibly. I wanted to give you a good sense of resources as well. So here's one, Collecting from Kids. It's a great piece from the Office of the Privacy Commissioner of Canada, what I've called here OPCC. The Office of the Privacy Commissioner of Canada is the federal regulator for privacy. Uh, when we talk about MFIPA, we're talking about provincial regulation and the Information and Privacy Commissioner of Ontario. However, I'm going to point you to resources that some of them are in the US, right? So all over the map. But we have some really great ones at the federal level as well. It was when there was a, a, a whole whack of cases that involving children that um, the commissioner came across in 2012, and then she created these guidelines. And it was based on these three main cases. One was a webcam, Nexopia, which is a, a social networking site for youth, and Gantz. So many of you would, have, would know about webkins.com. Gantz is actually an Ontario company. Uh, and their collection practices behind the scenes um, and registration of kids in this online play space. So there were concerns, and of course, the commissioner operates very much on a complaint-based model. So if there's a complaint, an investigation is conducted and findings are released. And there, you, know, you can see the findings for each of these cases on the commissioner's website, which is right here, priv.gc.ca. So Canada, we have guidance. We have no law around children, on, you know, uh, children online. Um, certainly MFIPA and uh, our other laws for uh, private schools, we have the, the private sector laws that would apply, but there's nothing that's really targeting children and youth. So 
In the US, we have the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, COPA. Everyone thinks of it as a consent law. It's actually a law, a lot more than that. Um, it has rules around what needs to be in your privacy policy, uh, privacy and security safeguards that need to be in place. But the piece that most people are familiar with is that operators of any online services or websites directed to children under the age of 13 must obtain parental consent before collecting and using the child's personal. PII is the term used um, in, in the States a lot. Personally identifiable information, same as what we call PI, personal information here. It's a really challenging piece of legislation. Like it's a very lengthy piece of legislation um, because of all the other requirements that people don't really often um, think about. The US Department of Education has done things like put obligations on school boards as well, saying schools need to assess the websites or online services, how they collect, use, disclose information, must assess their privacy policies, right? Uh, and this is that last bullet here. Schools can act in lieu of parents when the information is only used for the benefit of the school. Okay, so although there's the parental consent rule, there is that exception while schools can act if it's, if it's really for school purposes. Problem is these online services that do a lot more. And what the website operators have done to get around that is to say, thou shall not use this site if you're under 13. And that's the big problem. So schools use Prezi. Prezi says in its terms very clearly, if you're under 13, you shouldn't be here. So now not only are we in violation of the, of, um, the terms of the website, but if there's ever a legal issue, they're not going to take responsibility because they're, they're going to say, you weren't supposed to be here if you, weren't, if you were under 13. There's a lot of really useful tools that I find school boards are using that are specifically say because of COPA, they don't want to deal with the whole consent issue and the, um, you know, whether this is truly for s s uh, school purposes, particularly if they're engaging in behavioral advertising, right? So they're collecting data across websites. This was something that was, there was an attempt to try to address this in 2013, an amendment to the definition of what is personal information in COPA was expanded to include geolocation data, right? The whereabouts where you're accessing the app from, photos, videos, or audio files, as well as persistent identifiers, which are those cookies that can be placed on a person's computer such that now we're tracking your online activity as you move around on the internet. And that's the valuable information that a lot of these um, developers want to get access to. And so to get around COPA, we just say, under 13, don't come to our site. Do I have a solution for that? I mean, I, I, there is a, it becomes a risk question. So the big data fear, the predictive analytics based on educational metrics. I mean, it goes without saying that some of this is actually really good, right? The fact that we have some numbers on um, literacy rates that a lot of, a lot of the <coughs> very useful technology that's out there for children is based on doing some of the research on what works and what doesn't in the online space. So there's a value to some of that as long as it's um, helpful to the education of the child, right, and of, of the educational system. Uh, but a lot of organizations are using data about children for behavioral advertising and that's where it gets really sticky. This is where, you know, there's some interest in a particular toy or product. You now go elsewhere on the internet and you're followed around with ads for that particular product, right? And that's, I think, the, the key concern. So I think that's the, and that's the distinguisher in Canada. And you'll see some guidance on that where the commissioner is okay with looking at aggregate anonymous information for the purposes of improving services to children. But when we get into behavioral advertising, that's when it's an issue. That's when you need consent, right? So do we know whether the apps that our teachers download or that, you know, that are being used in the classroom, whether they're engaging in targeted advertising? That's, I think, pretty key. That, that should really be the, the key point where you need to get consent or find a new provider. Technical and statistical advances, I've said, have made it easier to take data that has been de-identified and link it back to students. That's the, con the big data concern, 
it's not the anonymous information. It's when we can get so much of that information that we'll be able to, we can profile students, right? Whenever we are sharing information with a third party who is analyzing data, there should be some concern. What is happening? Where is that data stored? And is it possible to re-identify students based on that data? These ed tech providers have the capacity to collect and retain large amounts of very sensitive data. And, and that's re really where we need to think twice um, and, and really provide guidance, I think, for teachers on what are acceptable tools and what aren't. And in fact, a lot of the school boards are starting to do that. And I'll give you a sense of some of those tools that are now considered sort of sanctioned or in the school board walls and others that uh, teachers really need to take responsibility for, for making it clear what they're using um, and being careful before they download their own tools. Nothing is free. That's the whole issue here, right? We have so many great free tools. Why are they free? There's a reason, <laughs> right? <laughs> they're, they're free because a lot of these app, these web apps, these um, what are called web 2.0 tools they want the data, right? They want the data, and that's what you're, that's how you're paying for the tool, right? So just keep that always in mind. Um, when it's free, that tells you, usually the cost is personal information. That's the cost, and that's what we need to be aware of. We do it all the time. We give our, per how many people have a Shoppers Drug Mart Optimum card as adults? Like, yeah, it's great to have the free perks. You get the, you know, you, you get the great discounts, the coupons. In exchange, I'm going to tell you all about my purchasing habits. And if you're good with that, you've exchanged, uh, you know, some of your privacy for some benefit. Well, the benefit for a lot of these providers is the information. And in exchange, you get to use this great new app. Um, this is a great statement that was made by the former uh, U.S. Secretary of Education. Student data must be secure and treated as precious. COPA requires that. It's not just a consent rule, remember? Uh, no matter where it's stored, it's not a commodity. And it's being treated right now as one. So we need to do at least our due diligence to, to check out what are these various apps doing, right? Um, I mean, the examples are endless. Here's just a few of them. All of them have some useful purpose. Right? So we Dropbox, a lot of, a lot of people in uh, schools and outside of schools use it just as an easy way to get information elsewhere. Right? I just want to, I'm going to drop it into an uh, uh, email box at home, and so I'm going to use Dropbox. Of course, Dropbox has everything, copies of everything through their backups that is where that tool is used. Right? At Moto. And they, and they mine that, right? They, they're looking, although they're not necessarily doing it in a personally identified way, they are mining data. They're volumes of data that they're looking at to get trends, for trends analysis. Edmodo is another one um, that a lot of schools use, and this is really for collaboration. It really helps you to have good communications with students and with, with parents. Teachers Assistant Pro. Is, and, and Class Dojo are all about behavior. It gives positive feedback back to parents. This is all wonderful, but Class Dojo <laughs> loves it as well for a reason, right? Because they're then engaged in that sort of tracking to be able to, um, to get some of those trends. And although that information may be de-identified, it's that risk of re-identification that we need to be concerned about. So what can we do about it, right? I mean, before I download her app, my lawyer here would like to ask a few questions. I mean, uh, if kids were really that, that uh, concerned, it would be great, but they're not, right? And so awareness raising is key, I think, at all levels. Now, I know that a lot of the school boards are using um, tools that are sanctioned already by your school board, right? Um, so. Clearly, when you're on the school system or network drive, where you may be storing uh, your performance um, reports, etc., uh, all those kinds of places, you can make an assumption of security. Because we rely heavily on the school boards for ensuring that that's a, a secure um, environment. And, and oftentimes, it'll be because it's already been sanctioned or because you're getting to it from your board login, right? 
Uh, examples of some of the ones that are often used, Moodle, I've seen um, with another school board that I worked with, Blogger often used as well. Um, and these are ones where we've told teachers, okay, you can use these tools. The problem is that there are so many out there, many, many more, that no one has vetted, right? And those are the ones to be most concerned about because we don't have a contractual relationship. The school board has no contractual relationship. And as we'll talk about under, uh, when we think about cloud computing, it's usually take it or leave it type terms, right? If you're using the tool, these are the rules, and that's all there is to it. This is where we need to be more cautious. What information do I really need to put in there? Do, is it necessary to store really sensitive information or identifiable information? Could we depersonalize? use aliases, right? Who will have access to the data? And of course, the more people who are going to have access, you need to be cautious about what you're sharing. And do we need parental consent? Or is that notice enough? So um, cloud computing is uh, an area that I wanted to talk about very, very briefly. But I did want to bring it up because there are some r this is a piece that actually very recently came out. There it is, February. Um, thinking about the clouds, this is from the IPC, uh, and it is a really good sense of what are the privacy and security risks and how do we mitigate them. And remember, when we're talking about any of these apps, we are talking about the cloud space, right? Data is not just sitting in one server, and it's sitting in potentially many different locations. And let's just talk about what the, dif what the definition is, because we often hear, oh, it's out in the cloud. <laughs> what, what exactly does that mean, right? Um, cloud computing is a model for enabling ubiquitous, convenient, on-demand network access to a shared pool. That's the, one of the concerns, right? You're sharing it with other um, users, clients, etc. Uh, shared pool of configurable computing resources, networks, servers, storage applications. Um, and oftentimes, I encourage my clients to use the cloud space when it's going to be more secure than their own servers. There's nothing wrong with cloud that way. And it can be rapidly provisioned and released with minimal management effort or service provider interaction. You actually can't really figure out where your data is. And there's no opportunity to say, can you please delete that, you know, the, the entries that were made yesterday? There's no, right? It, it, there's, there, there isn't that connection to get rid of the data. So there is loss of control. Um, lots of privacy risks. I want to uh, go through this rather quickly. Clearly, there's going to be new disclosures, new uses of the information because we have now a service provider involved who is interested in that data, right? Um, potentially unauthorized processing, <coughs> secondary purposes of, and use of that information. Are we going to be able to easily provide access and uh, our obligations under MFIPA around providing access to information? We need to make sure that that data is easily recoverable. Potential covert surveillance. That's a, a big scare right now, right? The fact that the US government now has access to it. You know, people, some of you may have heard of the Patriot Act concerns, right? The issues around um, uh, when we're dealing with a different jurisdiction, foreign um, authorities may have access to that data and, and the, you know, the Snowden and, and the cases that have come up because of, of surveillance. Um, information security, insider threats is of course a big one. The more people who have access to it, maybe on the perspective of the cloud provider, the potential for that data being snooped or accessed without authorization. Um, how are breaches detected or remediated? Where are your backups, right? Uh, when there's remote access to the data, are there risks associated with that and the fact that the data is not segregated, right? The data sits amongst other data that other clients are using, not just the school board. We're in a, often in a different jurisdiction, right? Because the cloud provider could have servers in many parts of the world. Uh, difficult to audit uh, what the information practices are. I mean, we make, make some assurances about our security of our own servers. But what do we do when it's a cloud provider? And often these take it or leave it contract terms. There's no room for that negotiation. Now, in some cases, there are. A lot of organizations will negotiate cloud terms, especially around breach detection and management. Uh, we need to start opening up that discussion and at least being aware of what cloud providers are doing from a breach management perspective as well. Social media 
is, is one of those examples, right? Social media sites often sit in cloud environments. It's, it's a great way to engage, often used to strengthen that homeschool connection. A lot of schools will have a Twitter feed or a Facebook page. It's more of a splash page to, to showcase a particular school. Um, but as soon as we get into that interaction, we need to start thinking about personal information. Know what your legal and policy obligations are. And, and you know, we talked about this when we talked about some of the, the um, terms of use of these third parties, including social media, right? Uh, social media sites, I mean, fit Twitter, Facebook have all received some bad rap when it comes to privacy and the fact that they retain data for a very long period of time. And then as much as we can, we're again minimizing the personal information. Okay, so let's move on um, to a topic that I really wanted to make sure we had uh, a good amount of time for, and that was text communications. Texting is becoming a real, um, a real interesting issue because students use it as a form of communication all the time. So it's a very convenient way of communicating and email is starting to become a little antiquated, right? Uh, I mean, I have a 14 year old son and email is like the worst way to get a hold of him. Right? <laughs> right? They're not checking their email accounts. They're, they're on text all the time. So one thing that a lot, of, a lot of boards I think are struggling with is what are the limits around texting? One thing to keep in mind is that always, unlike a face-to-face -face communication where we don't have a record, under MFIPA, we've developed a record as soon as there's a text message. A record that is accessible. In fact, recently, Rogers had, was uh, the subject of a, a large case involving cell phone dumps where um, there was a uh, request from the government for, because in the context of investigating a crime, to get all the text message that went on, um, that went through a particular cell phone to tower uh, at a, 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 on a particular day, right? So that, those, those are actual records that are available and accessible. So keep in mind that you're creating a record and, and be aware of that. I, you know, I've put that second bullet in there because it is such a great way to engage. I personally don't think that there's an issue with texting as long as there are very good guidelines or policies or rules in place. Texting often becomes quite personal. Can we set rules in place, and this is something for, for boards to think about, to limit exchanges to school-related topics? Uh, what I've seen uh, a board do on, on the East Coast is confine the use of texting to group texts only. Coach wants to let the students know that the practice has been canceled. They can send out a group text. Putting some rules in there as to when not to expect a response. Of course, texting has a very sort of 24 hour available type of <laughs> feel to it, right? So can we put some rules in to say, don't expect a response um, after a certain time or before a certain time of the day? Also, um, in the context of issues that are more urgent, texting is probably not the best way. Don't expect that someone's always gonna be ready and available. So as long as you think there's good rules in place, no sharing of other per people's personal information. Some of these came out of this test group that was done in the US um, where the students came up with some of these rules as a school board was trying, uh, a district as it's called there, was trying to really set up their own guidelines, which I think was a really interesting way to do it. Um, teachers, of course, don't necessarily want to give out their personal phone number. I mean, that's an, an issue as well. There are so many great tools out there to be able to mask one's phone number. I think as long as you've got good guidelines in place and a good policy around texting um, so that it doesn't get out of hand, I think it's the way we're going to have to communicate in the future. And, and even that's going to come out of date, right? So let's, let's really think about um, embracing some of this technology and doing it in a way that, uh, that is responsible. This is a really great piece in the US and organizations, developers, actually commit to it. So you can see the signatories for the US Student Privacy Pledge. And hopefully, we will eventually be in a place where we some, see something similar here in, in Canada, in Ontario, where in order to 
interact with our students or collect data, the service provider, being the app developer or the web service, would need to make certain commitments. So if you just do, and I actually provided the link at the end, if you just uh, even just do a, a search for the student privacy pledge and you can see the signatories that are involved, um, like Google, like Moodle, a lot of the ones that some of the school boards have uh, agreed for teachers to use and have sort of sanctioned. But what it does, it goes through the things that can't, you know, shall not happen by this service provider. I won't go through them in detail. I'm just going to leave this with you as a resource, right? Not selling information, um, you know, making sure it's for educational purposes, and then all the things that they are going to commit to, the things they won't do and the things they will do. Support, access, and correction, we mentioned, right? Uh, the last one there, ensure a successor entity, right? So the company gets sold. I mean, with a lot of these smaller companies, the, the uh, startups, they're, they're constantly being bought out and, or merging, um, that they're going to be subject to the same commitments. So there's, it's a really good piece that was put into place by the U.S. Department of Education to say, this is what you need to commit to, and if a, a district there then looks at who the signatory is, they can have some comfort that you've made these commitments. Just as, as a summary of what we've talked about, I thought, okay, let, let, what are the key takeaways here? We, as custodians of data, really need to think about how we can be leaders, and I think it's all about being clear on where that data sits and raising awareness. Uh, assume responsibility for the actions of educators and IT vendors, right? At the school board level, it's critical that we understand what people are using and what the risks are considering those terms of use, showcasing our internet behavior best practices for educators, right? What, what are the consequences of inappropriate tech use? We really need some rules, I think, in place, being transparent about what we're using, and considering whether we need consent or whether, in some contexts, notice is enough. And, and I think we've come a long way when it comes to privacy. You know, the first wave being uh, this is a statement of a U.S. Supreme Court judge, the right to be let alone, which is what privacy was thought of in the 1800s. We then went to the United Nations, privacy is the right to respect private and family life. That was sort of a second wave. We then came into a lot of these privacy laws. Um, in, the, in the early 2000s, this was, I think, key, was control. We want to have control over our personal information, and that's what privacy is all about, who it, who it goes to and where it's going. But I think we're coming into here where it's not just about having control, because actually, in many contexts, we don't have control anymore about where our data is going. It's about being transparent and having that trusting relationship. Our right, with respect to privacy and the rights of, of the families we deal with and the children, are the right to understand how personal information is being used so you can make informed choices. So, thank you very much. Thank you all for uh, being such a great audience this morning.